Good morning and welcome to New Philadelphia Moravian Church on this Sunday, August 15th. We are so glad you're here in person or watching online. Now, would you please stand and join me as we pray the liturgy together. Spirit of God, we praise and worship you as the one who gave birth to Christ's church. With the sound of mighty wind and flashing fire, you brought life to the church in Jerusalem. You filled those frightened new believers with power, and they became Christ's witnesses, speaking boldly the word of truth. You continue to transform believers, healing, reconciling, empowering, Lives are turned around, emptiness is filled, drifting hearts are given direction. You vitalize your wavering church, lavishing gifts upon us, forging unity, giving new vision. You turn our eyes from the wistful memories of yesterday to the new things you are doing among us now. We worship and extol you, our teacher, guide, and comforter. You make Christ known to us and make us your holy temple. By your presence, the church in all its diversity is welded together in unity. Interceding spirit, we do not know how to pray as we ought, but you understand our deepest needs and present them with love to the Father. Lead us now to repentance and confession. <laughs> Spirit of holiness, we confess that we are a sinful people. In thought, word, and deed, we quench the fire of your love and dissipate the power of your presence. You long to restore us to the image of God, but we let it tarnish as we nurse selfish attitudes. You nurture unity, 
but we sow discord. You come to make our bodies your temples, but we desecrate them. We ought to disappear intense for us. Forgive us, merciful spirit. Burn away our impurities and forge us into renewed and useful instruments in your service. Amen. You may be seated. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. We believe God's promise in these last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Upon both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall speak my message. The Spirit of God dwells in us if we belong to Christ. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we receive power and we become God's witnesses. The fruit of that Spirit brings the lives of those who follow Christ is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The diverse and empowering gifts of the Spirit are given to each one for the common good. None of us is useless to God. None of us is sufficient by ourself. We serve through the body of Christ, and we depend on the people of Christ. The Spirit's gifts are given to equip believers for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Come, heavenly dove, and alight upon us. Anoint us to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release, recovery, and freedom to those in need. Empower us to work for God's kingdom in such a way that life becomes a jubilee for us and for all people. Lift up the lonely, the neglected, the outcast, comfort the grieving, restore the lost, be the advocate of the afflicted. Teach all your people, remind us of Jesus, and lead us into all the truth. Keep us on the edge of dynamic living, wrapped in the flames of new beginnings and filled with power for personal renewal. Form us in the likeness of Christ that we may glorify God's name. Renew your church. Fill stagnant and empty lines with the breath of God. Overcome our apathy and energize us with your engaging presence. Give your church new vision, new hope, and a driving desire to claim the promise of new birth. Spirit of power, work in all who confess the risen Christ to spread your message of hope, love, and salvation to every person and nation. Hasten the day when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Please stand.
please be seated. And here is some of the news of the church. Today's game, I assume, is still on, and it's at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We still have a good number of tickets. I have them right here and would love to sell you one for $5 right after the service back in the Commons area. Um, so please come and be part of this outing. It's always a really good time. Now, does anyone recognize this, even from where you're sitting? It's Dick, Jane, and Sally. Don't you remember? <laughs> Honestly, we look and see, and here are Sally and her cat Puff on the front. What does this have to do with today's service? Not one thing. However, <laughs> it does have to do with the kickoff for Fantastics. You know, we have today's game, which is a Fantastics-led event, but we always sort of kick off the season with a special event, and for the last few years, it's been an antiques roadshow, our version at least. Now, this year, it's going to be really, really fun because I'm asking that you bring something from your childhood. Your favorite toy, obviously a book was not a toy, but I remember this so fondly, and so all of you, I'll bet, have something in a closet buried deep in the back of a drawer that is from your childhood, and we'd love for you to bring it. If you don't have one single thing left from your childhood, I'm so sorry, but please <laughs> go online and, and print out a picture and bring that picture, or if you don't want to do that, just come. You'll have two minutes to talk about some item from your childhood that has still a special memory for you. This is an event that has nothing to do with age, um, we invite all to come. There will be lunch to follow. This is on the second Thursday of September, which is, I believe, the 9th. But there will be so much laughter. And by the way, we, we do talk a lot about how, especially after a year of COVID, we don't always know each other very well. This is your chance to know each other well. You've got to come out to where we are. So please consider attending this event. It'll be a couple of hours out of your morning, and it will really be fun. Now, our South Fork meeting is this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the Friendship Room. If you have any interest in serving in any way at our local school, South Fork Elementary, over the coming year, please come to this meeting. Marla Sparks will present us with a lot of options. By the way, one thing that the school asked for, and I notice it hasn't been done yet, but their open house, I believe, is on Friday, and um, or perhaps it's Thursday, but in any case, I was thinking that it would be nice, and they have asked that we do something to beautify the grounds. They'd like some flowers around their sign. I think it would be easy to put some vinca and some marigolds around that sign. If anybody would like to join me Thursday morning around 9.30 for probably 30 minutes, um, I think we could make things look really pretty over at South Fork. So let me know following the service or just email me in the next couple of days. Last week, we welcomed Lou Carrico from the Winston-Salem Rescue Mission. He gave us a really inspiring um, brief overview of the work of the mission, and then he attended our missions um, committee meeting in the afternoon. Just wanted you to know that we are working with Rescue Mission to have them be one of our 12 days of Christmas, or I'm sorry, 12 days of service. And I know that's in December and a ways off, but um, hey, is there any better time than right now to talk about Christmas? And so I want to mention one more thing. We do plan to have an Advent devotion guide again this year, and we have decided on the theme, which is going to be the names of Jesus. This is going to be really exciting as we read each other's devotions about 25 scripture passages that mention a different name of Jesus. It's going to be a really educational advent and one that will be a little different. I think that's everything from me, and so thank you very much for your attention. We are observing the festival of August 13th today, and I'll say a little bit more about that later in the service. But the one thing I want to say right now is that prayer 
played a huge role in what happened on that day. That's the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. We always talk about that amazing outpouring of the Spirit, but sometimes forget to mention that a lot of people had been praying for a long time for that to happen. The same thing happened for August 13th in our history as Moravians. A lot of people were praying that people could just focus on, on, on Jesus and focus on getting um, God's word into the hearts of as many people as possible. And God answered those prayers. And we can still today, all these many years later, come together in prayer. So I ask you to join me in prayer right now. Gracious and loving God, we're thankful this morning that we can be here, that we have a place to gather, shelter and warmth and cooling when needed. We thank you for giving us light in our darkness for our gathering this past Thursday night. We thank you for the way that we see you present with us in your word, in scripture, in the daily text each day, in the words of our sisters and, and brothers in this congregation and in many other ways. We ask that you would be present in a special and powerful way with those who need you most today. Be with the family and friends of Brian Huffman. Continue to be with Michael Krotz, and Jeff Kreisen, Lisa Saunders. We're thankful for good test results for Kathy Dull and so many others, dear God, in our congregation that you know their immediate and ongoing needs. And Lord, we know that you are with all of them, and we know that you are here in this place, and that you do hear our prayers. Just a reminder that we can continue to support the exciting ministries that Clyde always tells us about and others that we are aware of in and through our congregation with our gifts and tithes and offerings. Also, starting this morning, I'm asking you to take a moment to write your name and the best way of contacting you in the friendship register. Those have been there all along and sometimes they've been used and sometimes not, but beginning today, I'd like to be intentional about that because it will serve two purposes. It will provide helpful information in case we need to contact you concerning a health situation. And since I will begin collecting and reading these after each service, it will help me in my continuing process of putting names to the faces that I am seeing more and more of each Sunday. And so I thank you for doing that. If you've already done that, it's fine. If not, you can use this time during the offering to, to pass those down. Let's pray. 
Holy One, we are but the work of your voice, a unique whisper amid your vast creation. May we find strength to return to you, our source, that we could amplify your word throughout the world. Use our gifts for your purpose. Amen.
Today's epistle reading comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Gospel reading this morning is once again from the sixth chapter of John. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. These are words from God's word. Invite the children, if there are any here, to depart for children's worship at this time.
an old country preacher preached a really good sermon one Sunday and everybody in the congregation expressed their appreciation and affirmation as they shook his hand at the door. But they were a bit puzzled the following Sunday when they realized about halfway into the sermon that it was the exact same sermon that he had preached the previous Sunday. No one stopped him, but afterwards when he was at the door, one of the deacons came up to him and said, Preacher, you know that was the same sermon you preached last Sunday? And the old preacher replied, Yes, I do, and I'm going to keep on preaching it until y'all start doing it. Well, apparently, John and Paul, and I'm not referring to half of the Beatles, but the Gospel of John and Paul's letter to the Ephesians have decided to keep on preaching it until everybody's doing it. You may or may not have noticed that this is the fourth Sunday in a row that the assigned Gospel reading is from the sixth chapter of John. And we've been in the first few chapters of Ephesians for the past five weeks, and we still have one Sunday to go in both of those. So what is it that they're wanting everybody to get and do? What is the message contained in these repeated readings? Well, as I look back over John chapter 6 and the, the first few chapters of Ephesians, the message that I hear over and over again is simply, leave room for Jesus. And by the way, that's also the instruction that is given at Laurel Ridge to campers at the dance party, especially during the slow dances, leave room for Jesus. <laughs> but all of these readings seem to be saying over and over again, don't be satisfied with temporal things when you can have eternal things. Don't fill yourself and your life with so many lesser things, whether good or bad, that you don't have room for the best thing. Our life in the spirit is what we're created for. Our source of sustenance and salvation is Jesus. Don't let him be the leftovers when he wants to be the main course. Jesus himself said that when we order our lives around God's principles, then all of these other things will fall into their proper place. But that's not always the reality of our lives. We can sometimes see that in the way we, we view our participation in church activities. We try to fit them into our schedules with all of the other activities and organizations and commitments instead of seeing them as the first factor or first priority in our planning and scheduling. I'm not saying that we need to order our lives around God's temple, but I am saying that we need to order our lives according to God's template. And God's template, God's model, is about making sure that things that are of eternal value and significance take preference over things that come and go. I was thinking about something this past week. It had never really dawned on me before, and I don't want to make too much of this, but I thought it was interesting that if on a Friday afternoon I say to someone, have a good weekend, what I mean by that is have a good Saturday and Sunday. We think of Sunday as the end of the week. Sometimes it's a, it's a time to deal with all of the loose ends of the week, a time to catch up, catch up on sleep or, or housework or yard work or other things that we need to do before we start a new week on Monday. But of course, biblically speaking, Sunday is the first day of the week, not the last. And I think we can understand that symbolically. It means that God comes first. We begin with God. God's time is what matters the most. Now, putting Jesus first doesn't mean ignoring everything else. No, Jesus cares about every aspect, every area of our lives, not just the things that we do here at church. Jesus is concerned for our physical and emotional needs as well as our spiritual needs. John chapter 6 deals with physical bread and spiritual bread. And Jesus offered the crowd both of those. And he didn't say, well, I'll feed you, but first you have to sit through a long sermon about the bread of life, and then we'll have a love feast. No, it's a long sermon. How long? Well, let's just say it's going to take Sam five Sundays to preach the whole thing. 
No, he gave them what they needed, and then he said, now let me show you what you really need. And he invited them to eat the bread of life. And in the passage that we heard today, that word eat appears seven times in eight verses. Well, sort of. Let me explain. You've probably heard me several times talk about the differences in English and Greek and how sometimes there are differences in words in Greek that aren't reflected in the English translation. For example, we know that there are at least three or four different words for love in Greek, but all of them are translated in English as love. And I said that eat appears seven times in the passage, but the first two times one Greek word is used, and the next five times another Greek word is used, even though in English it just says eat. The first two times, when it refers to eating physical bread or even manna, the bread from heaven, the word that is used means simply eat. But the next five times, when Jesus is talking about eating the bread of life, we might think that he would use a more spiritual word, like maybe partake or even consume. But the best way that I can describe the Greek word that is used for eating the bread of life is to tell you to think back to how your mother always told you not to eat. In my case, it was, Sam, don't chew with your mouth open. Chew each bite 20 times, but don't smack your lips. The person next to you at the table doesn't need to hear that you were chewing. Well, Jesus pretty much broke all of mom's rules of etiquette with the word that he used. The word can be translated as gnaw, or chomp, or crunch, or chew loudly. It's the Greek word that Homer used in the Odyssey to describe how mules eat. It reminds me of buzzards eating a carcass, not even seeming to care that they might get hit by a passing vehicle, so focused on devouring this unexpected and undeserved meal. That's not a very pretty image. Then again, neither is eating flesh and drinking blood or having one's flesh broken and one's blood spilled. But that's what Jesus did for us so that we might have life and that we might take and eat of his body broken for us and drink of his blood, the blood of the new covenant that was shed for us and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus wants us to desire that even more than we desire other food and other things in our lives. Paul gives an example and says that if we are filled with wine, or he says drunk with wine, it may feel good for the moment, but he says it's, it, it's wastefulness because before long we'll be back to how we were feeling before we had the wine. So he says it's better to be filled with the Spirit, something that is eternal and life-giving. And Jesus wants us to desire those eternal things more than anything else in our lives. What does that look like? Well, let me show you. Now, you might not be able to see this very clearly where you are, but I'll describe it. This is what used to be the lid of a food storage container that keeps food fresh because it closes or seals so tightly. I sometimes have a hard time opening the container. Now, I say used to be the lid because now it's covered with holes that are the shape of our dog Lobo's teeth. I was gone from the house for about three hours, and the container was up on a shelf above the kitchen cabinet, theoretically out of Lobo's reach, now, before I tell you the rest of the story, let me assure you, we do feed our dog. He's basically never actually hungry. He's well cared for, and he weighs about 95 pounds. But he had had Cindy Wall's cookies before. It didn't matter that he had already eaten. He wanted what was in that container. He desired it. He desired it enough to find a way to defy the laws of physics and gravity and somehow get the container on the kitchen floor and without the luxury of thumbs, but rather relying on sharp teeth, get that container open and devour what was inside. I wasn't there to witness it. 
but I'm sure it involved gnawing and chomping and smacking and chewing loudly, totally focused on the thing he most desired. Maybe Jesus wants us to chew the lids off of the containers that keep us sealed in the systems and structures and schedules of our own making and to be set free to desire him as much as Lobo desires those cookies. Some of our spiritual predecessors in the Moravian church were set free in such a way by God's spirit. What we now know as the Moravian church was officially founded in 1457, but for a long time it had to be more like an underground church because of all the persecution. People weren't free to worship God and live out their faith openly. So you can imagine how thrilled they were when a young man in his early 20s, a man named Nicholas Zinzendorf, opened up his large estate and invited people to come and live there and worship God and be set free. All kinds of people showed up. They all believed in God and they were all followers of Jesus. But a lot like today, there were lots of things they didn't agree on. One of our hymns says, they walked with God in peace and love, but failed with one another. It got worse and worse, and Zinzendorf was really frustrated and, and wanted to fix the situation, and he had everyone sign a document agreeing to get along as brothers and sisters, but you can't always legislate unity. Things were still not getting any better. So on Tuesday, August 5th, 1727, Zinzendorf and 14 other men spent the entire night praying and calling out to God. And that Sunday, August 10th, the pastor was preaching but felt helpless, like his words weren't making any difference. And he decided to stop preaching and he just got down on the floor and started praying. It must have been an awkward moment. But then people followed his lead. And they prayed until midnight that night. And on Wednesday, August 13th, they had a communion service where two girls were confirmed, and that's when God surprised them. God showed up in an amazing way in answer to their prayers. And as they felt Christ's presence, they felt drawn to each other as well, and they asked forgiveness of each other and, and just wanted to be with each other. They didn't want to leave. So Zinzendorf provided some food for them to share together, and that's why the Moravian Church often has love feasts. But I asked some historians what food was served at that first love feast on August 13th, and they didn't know. There doesn't seem to be any record of the physical bread or food that was served. All that we know is that when together they desired the living bread, the bread of life, those other things started to fall into place. And the result of that spiritual freedom was, well, us. They desired Jesus, but they also were filled with a burning desire for everyone to know Jesus. And they started going out to share physical bread and spiritual bread throughout the world. And 294 years and two days later, here we are. Here to feed upon the bread of God. Here to drink the royal wine of heaven. Here to lay aside each earthly load. Here to taste afresh the calm of sin forgiven. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you offer us this living bread. You offer us life. God, help us to, little by little, step by step, order our lives around the purpose that you have for each of us. Thank you for filling us with your spirit and giving us the power to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. We turn to the celebration of Holy Communion, remembering the events in our history and remembering the sacrifice of our Lord. When we sing the hymn in a minute, I would invite you anytime during the hymn to stand and look to those around you and, and, and give a wave or greet them in some way with, with the right gesture of, of fellowship. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine that point us to the greatest gift of your life given for us, your body broken for us, and your blood shed for us. Help us to truly desire the bread of life and the eternal gifts that you give us, more than the temporal blessings and joys that this life might offer to us. Thank you, God. Thank you. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection, bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
You take away the sin of the world. Grant to us your peace. Amen. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. We stand and sing the hymn, and once again I invite you to greet each other with the right gesture, gesture of fellowship, signifying our renewed commitment to be the body of Christ together in the world. As I lift a hand asking God's blessing on us, I also invite you to lift a hand asking especially for people who need physical bread that they would receive that and for people who have not had the amazing joy that we have of knowing the bread of life that they would have that as well. So we lift a hand asking for the world to be fed with physical bread and with the bread of life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name.